are you today? Uh, so I am uh, Renata Borges, I work at Troika. So today we're going to talk about classroom management for young learners. Hello, hello everybody. I'm so happy you're here today. Hello, Mexico. Um, if you have any comments, you have the chat box, right? Um, and you can also ask questions throughout the, the session. I don't know if everybody already teaches uh, children or if this is news uh, for you. So if you have comments, if you have questions, feel free to ask them, right? Um, so let's start today. Oh, I hope you like it. Um, and we're going to see um, in this session what classroom management is and how taking children's characteristics into consideration, we can use some strategies to help us uh, to manage our lessons in a positive way. I would like us to start our session today with something different. I want us to um, start with a testimony from a teacher about her first experience teaching young learners right so i'm going to start with this testimony okay so this teachers this teacher uh, says i had a class of 36 9 and 10 year olds in a school where the desks were nailed to the floor okay um recently qualified and eager to try out new techniques i got the children to do an information gap activity which required them to mingle and to exchange information with others in their role. Although the activity started well and the children seemed motivated, which is always a good start, right? What would have been a standard procedure with adult groups turned into chaos? The more I asked the children to sit down, the more they moved about. The more I raised my voice, asking them to be quiet, the louder the noise level grew. The more agitated I began to feel, the more boisterous they became. I had fallen unwittingly into the classic trap of allowing my behavior as a teacher to contribute to rather than solve the problem. I found myself imposing an emergency dictation in order to settle the children down and reestablish control. Um, I wanted to start with this testimony for two reasons. The first one is, I think we can all relate to that situation. Everybody who um, teaches children, I think, can relate to that situation. I certainly do. Um, I can. And think also that it's important to reveal this teacher's identity. Because this difficult situation happened to no one else but... Carol Reed. She didn't tell me this personally, but she describes it in a great article uh, called The Challenge of Teaching Children, which was published in the English Teaching, a professional journal, and is available for download on her website, carolreed.com. Um, and I wanted to bring this testimony because I think that no one can say that Carol Reed can't teach children, right? Uh, she is certainly an expert. And um, also, I wanted us to see that this can be challenging for everybody. Classroom management for young learners can be challenging for everybody, especially when we are starting our career. And some situations can make it even more challenging, such as having 36 students in class or having desks that are nailed to the floor. 
Um, I remember at the beginning of my career when I had my first group of children, there were only eight, uh, like eight or 10 maybe of them, not 36. But it was enough for my coordinator at the time to walk by my classroom during a lesson and then ask me later, what was going on in that classroom, which was a complete chaos. And I remember answering, well, everything was fine. They were just being children. And okay, that was me not wanting to admit that my class might have been a little out of control. But that was also me saying something that I still believe today, which is children are not adults. And I know it may seem obvious. Of course, we all know that children are not adults. But sometimes I think we expect children to behave like us, to behave like adults. And that doesn't help our lessons. If we don't take children's characteristics into account when we plan our lessons, we will get chaotic lessons. And another thing I believed at that time, and I still believe is, classroom management is not about control. As we are going to see, classroom management is not about bossing students around and giving orders during the lesson. And I'm glad it isn't, because I don't believe in an education that wants to control children. Um, the term classroom management refers uh, to the organization and uh, directive function of the learning process. And many people will associate classroom management with students' behavior in class. And it is indeed one of the factors we talk about when we talk about classroom management. But it is more than that. Classroom management is not only about discipline. It is not only about making students behave the way we want them to. It is about organizing an effective learning process. And I think that today, in 2023, most of us, I hope most of us, believe that children should be at the center of their learning process. But we are still the organizers of this process. So the first step for successfully managing a classroom is planning. And my question is, how much planning can we do? Because as teachers, we know that a lot of the decisions that we make, we have to make for a lesson, they are in-flight decisions. They are decisions we have to make, we have to take at that moment. We can't plan. But thinking about that, how much planning can we do? And in a lesson, we can plan the environment, we can plan the activities, the materials we are going to use, we can plan patterns of interactions, interaction, and we can plan in in instructions. And we are going to see why these aspects are so important when we talk about classroom management for young learners. Um, when we think about uh, environment, what I mean is it's important that we have a welcoming environment, we have a comfortable environment, an environment that is safe for children and organized. And there are some things that can help us with that. Two things that are very important when uh, we talk about uh, uh, young learners. Do you, can you, can you, do you think you can try to guess in the chat box what are two things that are very important when we talk about the environment, the classroom, uh, in lessons for young learners? 
Do you think you can try to guess? Warm up. Mm -hmm. To put students in the mood, right? For the lesson. This is certainly very important also. Visual aids. Okay, yes, because they are very visual. Ah, they space. Certainly, if we don't have uh, uh, desks nailed, uh, nailed to the floor, the floor, it makes it, it easier for us. Um, enough room, comfortable chairs. That's it. Also, we are talking about the physical uh, space here. Yes, but I was also thinking sense of belonging. This is very important, and we're going to talk about that. But I was also thinking about two other things that are very important when we teach young learners. The first is, I don't want to sound boring with this, and I promise it won't be boring, but the first is rules. We have to talk about rules when we talk about uh, classroom management for young learners. Um, and the second is routines. And you're going to talk about, yes, habits. That's it. And you're going to talk about that. So, uh, yes. Okay. So we have rules and routines. And when we are talking about rules, we have some ideas, we have some strategies on how we can deal with rules for young learners. The first one is have as few rules as possible. When we have too many rules, they might be too challenging for children to understand, to remember, and if they can't understand the rules, if they can't remember them, they won't follow them. We also run the risk of making our environment less fun when we have too many rules. And children may feel demotivated. And this is not what we want. We want them to feel interested. We want them to feel motivated in this environment. Too many rules also give the impressions that they are not important. When we have too much, when we have too many of something, of some items, we tend to think that they are not very important. Yes, for young learners, I mean children, uh, we have a classification for young learners. Teens too, yes, teens are included when we, we say uh, young learners. Um, Usually, the classification is for adolescents until 18 years old. So we are talking about high school. If you are talking about regular school, for example, they are still in the classification of young learners. And rules are certainly important for them, too. But when we talk about um, children, rules, they are also very important because when children enter, uh, when uh, teenagers enter a classroom, for example, they are not entering a classroom for the first time. So they already know how a lesson works and things that they should do, how they should behave in, in a classroom at school. But children, they are still developing and they are still in, um, in the process of becoming citizens. Um, so these rules, they are not very clear for them. So that's why my focus uh, when I talk about rules is uh, on children. But also, if you're talking about rules for teenagers, of course, this is also important that we have rules uh, regarding um, gadgets, electronic gadgets, for example. Can they use them? not why not because it is also important for them and uh, if they can use it how and when uh, can they use them for example uh, but we are going to see this in a minute but yes teens they are also considered uh, young learners um, we also had a question uh, before a few minutes um, ago asking if toddlers are considered young learners yes they are uh, toddlers they are very young learners um, we can talk a little bit maybe if we have time about this classification of um, 
uh, young learners, but usually any kind of children and teenagers too. Um, Another important aspect when we talk about rules in the classroom, and I mean that for children and for teenagers too, is to involve them into making the, the, the rules. Why do I say that? Because rules sometimes, they may be imposed by the institution, by the school where we work, or we can feel that we need to establish the, these rules to manage our classroom. Um, but it is a good idea to include the learners into the creation of these rules at the beginning of our work together. Um, we can always elicit what learners think they should or shouldn't do in the classroom to help us create the rules. And we can have them work together on a list of basic classroom rules. Um, we, when we teach learners, uh, as we, we said before, we always try to put them uh, at the center of the process right? Um, and also, I feel that when we talk about rules, if we're talking about their environment, if we're talking about their classroom, uh, they should be included in this process too. The same idea applies to the creation of rules. They should be included. Another good idea to involve learners is to always use inclusive language when we talk about these rules that we created. It's our rules for our classroom. This way, they feel that they have contributed to the rules as well. Um, and we also should always remind students that they helped create the rules according to how they think we should behave in the classroom right another very important thing and uh, sometimes we don't do that but another very important thing when we talk about rules is they should be explicit i'm sorry they should be explicit and why do i say that because when we talk about children, they have no awareness of unwritten rules. When we enter a classroom, we know how we should behave. But this is not necessarily true to children. This is true to teenagers, but it's always a good idea to remind them of uh, the expected behavior um, in, in a classroom, because sometimes they seem to forget. We cannot follow rules if we don't know what they are. And if we cannot follow rules, if we don't know them, we cannot break them. So we cannot try to apply rules that our students don't know if they are not aware of these rules. And that is why it's important to establish rules at the beginning of every term. When we start our work together, we make we create the rules together and we make them clear for everybody. We make them explicit um, for everybody. And this is why it's so important. We need to make learners aware of the rules that they should follow. And to do that, we should also explain the rules. If we can, we cannot follow rules if we don't know them and we cannot follow rules that we don't understand. So rules should be explicit and they should be clear to everybody. So we should make sure that learners understand the rules and we should make sure they understand why these rules are important. For example, we can say, if we want to speak, we have to put up our hands. Because if we all talk at once, no one listens to what we say. This is different from saying, raise your hands if you want to speak. Um, the idea is to try to make learners understand why this rule is important. So they can try to think about the consequences of not following these rules. Modeling the rules 
can also help with that. So when we are explaining rules, we should always show them how to raise their hands to speak, or we should indicate the volume of our voice when we speak, right? So it's important to explain the rules. Another thing that is very important for children and for teenagers too, the rules should be fair, right? The rules should be fair. It is important that any rules we establish are seen or perceived as fair by the children and by teenagers. And also that you can actually enforce, you can actually apply these rules. For example, a rule that says that we need to speak only English in the classroom. Is it fair? We may think it is, but what they think is, well, I can't say everything in English. So how can I speak only English if I don't know all the words? So for them, it, this rule might be unfair because they don't have... Um, the all the the level the, all the english that they need to speak only in l2 so how about instead of saying only speak english we ask them to ask before they speak their mother tongue right so can you ask if you don't know how to to speak in english can you ask if in this situation you can speak in portuguese or in spanish right um, so this is the idea it's not to have um, students decide that every rule is not fair but it's making the rule seem fair to them also we should try to make the rules always positive why because our brain doesn't deal very well with the negative so it's better when we think about positive rules. Um, if we say, for example, we mustn't shout in the classroom. What do you think about? We think about shouting. So a better rule would be we must talk in this volume in the classroom, right? We must talk in, use this volume when we talk in the classroom. Also very important we should never fail to apply the rules. Learning how to follow rules is part of the development of a child. They learn that we all follow rules because we do that to live as an organized society. And they learn that breaking the rules has consequences, right? So if learners break the rule, the rules, it is very important that we are there to apply them. And then we come to routines. Do you have routines? If you teach young learners, do you have routines in your lessons? Let me see here. Why of you, you you answer here we had a question that was very interesting um with uh, what we if we share a classroom if we share a group with a head teacher right uh this is always a good idea as we involve learners into making the rules we can have everybody together we are all a community in a classroom. A classroom is a community, so we can always collaborate with each other, right? Yes, circle time for starting the lessons. Hello, goodbye. Yes, that's nice. That's it. Okay. So, what are routines in a lesson? They are patterns of behavior in which everybody knows what is expected at that moment and what they should do, right? Um, so with very young learners and with young learners, they play a very important role. 
Then you're going to ask, how about teenagers? Yes, they are important too, because teenagers need routine. The habits are very good for our brain. When we understand what's going to come, what, what's going to happen at the next moment, what's going to happen in that day, this is always helpful for us. It helps us feel organized. It helps us, it help us feel safe in that environment, right? Um, so, routines help children feel secure and confident in the classroom. Um, children, they are just learning how the wor world works. And teenagers, too, they know a lot about the world, but it, they are still learning a lot about it. And I know sometimes for us, it can be difficult to understand the world too, right? I feel, I feel it. But for children, it is harder. So having routines help them feel secure, have to, they feel confident because they know what they are expected to do. Um, routines, they also foster a sense of uh, community. They foster a sense of belonging. We all know together, we know and we share the way we work and we do things together in the classroom, right? Routines help, uh, help children be part of a group. They promote cooperation. For example, I think people mentioned, some of you mentioned in the chat box about uh, a routine for tidying up the classroom, right? Very important. It fosters... Uh, Collab uh, collaboration and cooperation, and they also play an important role in language acquisition, right? Uh, somebody says, uh, when you welcome students in the classroom, when you welcome students and you, you talk about the weather, for example, at the beginning of every class, maybe the weather is not the topic of your lesson, but it is uh, exposure to um this kind of language so it also helps in acquisition of a language and routines this is for us routines can be a shortcut routines um, help us save our energy and they help us save our voice as well right um so when we establish routines, children will only need a prompt to know what to do. Maybe this prompt will be a gesture that we're going to create together. For example, can we have a gesture for circle time? And then every time you do this gesture, they already know that um, they need to sit in a circle, right? Um, or we can have a word we can have a song, somebody mentioned a song, right? We can have a tidy, a, a, a song that tells us that it's time to tidy up the classroom. So when I play this song, they already know what they have to do. I don't need to give instructions about that. We can also use pictures to represent different routines, right? If you have on your wall some pictures and students already know and understand uh, with what each picture uh, represents, you can just point to the pictures and they will know what they have to do, right? So they are a shortcut. They help us save our energy. They help us save our voice. We can use routines to welcome learners into the classroom, to start and to finish our lessons. Uh, in transition stages also, right? If it's desk time, if it's circle time, we can use routines to get students' attention. Uh, we can use them to do particular activities. For example, if I have story time, uh, and I can use routines also to tidy up the classroom about an activity. Also, when we plan, very important for classroom management, that we plan our activities and our materials. They should always be age appropriate, first of all. 
they should also be engaging, right? Uh, because we need learners to be motivated. Demotivated children and teenagers too tend to get disruptive when we don't it we don't want that. So we need to keep them engaged in the activities. This will only happen um, if we plan our activities according to their interests. It's very important also to consider that children they have a short a shorter attention span than adults. How about teenagers? They have a longer attention span uh, than children. But let's think about teenagers today. Let's think about short videos, 15 second videos. This is what their brains are getting used to. So our attention span, not only teenagers, but also adults, is getting shorter too. So it's important um, that we understand that they can't focus for a long time. So it's best if we plan short activities. Lo very long activities will not work because they can't focus. So it's important that we plan shorter activities. And also that we plan different kinds uh, of activities. This means that we should anticipate the effect that these activities can have on learners. And then I'm talking about this here, stir or settle. Um, if we plan a game, for example, what is the effect on learners? They love it, great, but games tend to stir students. They tend to make them more agitated right so after a game what do what can i do it's important to plan a settling activity something that is going to calm students down and maybe you're thinking okay i have just discovered the secret to teaching young learners i'm only going to plan calm activities so this way they're always calm can you think why, about why this wouldn't work? It has to do with the children's innate characteristics. They need movement. Moving their little bodies is part of their development. So they're going to move because they need to move. That is why it's better to plan for this need for movement rather than being surprised by children who can't sit still, right? Also, we have our instructions. Okay, do we have to, pre do we have to plan instructions? Yes, that's a good idea to plan instructions. And they should be simple and they should be short. Um, in most cases, we are talking about uh, a limited level of English, right? So it's ideal to keep instructions simple and with language that we know our students can understand. They should also be short. Why should they be short? So learners can follow and remember them. Okay, but what if we are trying to do a more complex um, activity with my students, for example? What if I'm trying to have a project with them? What can I do? I can't have short, very short instructions, right? With a, a project. But in this case, what can we do? Break down the instructions. We don't need to explain everything, everything at once. We can break down the activity in different stages, in smaller stages, and then we give the instructions for each stage, right? These will help learners follow uh, our instructions because they will remember, they will be able to remember these instructions. As much as we want um, 
our lessons to be student-centered. With young learners, we are still uh, we still need to lead them, to guide them through the activities in the lesson. So modeling is another important aspect of giving instructions. Invite volunteers to model the activity with you, for example. And then when we ask, do you understand what you have to do? We can't accept just yes as an answer. Um, why? Because they will say, if we if we ask, do you understand what you have to do? They will say what? Yes. And then when they start doing the activity, they will have lots of questions or they won't be able to do it. And that happens not because our students want to annoy us or because they want to disrupt our lessons. They do that because they honestly think they understood. So they will answer yes, probably. And then when they start to do the activity, then they think, ah, oh, no, I don't know how to do that. What do I have to do here? Because we didn't model, we didn't demonstrate what they should do in the activity. So it's very important that we demonstrate uh, what they have to do, right? Okay. And then we have, ah, okay, we have a great comment here. Really like it. Uh, Luana is saying that when she has students coming from physical education class, can you imagine the level of energy? Yes. Um, she takes a minute or two uh, for breathing exercises with them, which help them calm down. This is also a good idea, Luana. I, I've had groups in which I started the lesson with some calming activity, with some breathing exercises, because uh, they were very energetic. So it's important and that we understand what Luana is saying is also uh, very important, because it's important that we understand our context. Um, how do my students feel when they come to the classroom? Do they have a lot of energy because they were in a physical education activity? Uh, or are they tired? It's at the end of the day. It's the last lesson of the day. They are too tired. They don't want to stand up. So it's important that we understand our context, where our students uh, are coming from, how they feel, also important that we consider their personalities also, right? Are they calmer or are they more energetic so we can um, deal with classroom management in a more personal way, in a more personalized way, right? What we are talking about here today are some ideas, some strategies that we're going to, to use. They are not going to work for all of your groups. Not all of them are going to work for all of your students. Uh, the idea is for us to pick, to select uh, the ideas that we think are going to work for our students right? So it's very important that we um, get to know our students so we understand um, how we can use these ideas and these strategies um, to, to help them, right? To help, to, to help us, to help ourselves manage our classroom. And then we come to Patterns of interaction, right? Ah, here, two mm, patterns of inter. Ah, no, not here. So yes, two patterns of interaction, right? So ah, yes, I forgot. Oh, some ideas for us to check our uh, our instructions in an effective way, right? We never ask, okay, or do you understand? And if you happen to um, 
ask students, do you understand? Don't just accept yes as an answer. Ask them to demonstrate, invite them to model what they should do. Ask them to repeat or to paraphrase uh, the instructions. With some students, you might need to ask them to um, translate them into their language, right? Um, also, as soon as they start the activity, our work is not done, right? When they start doing the activity, it's not time to, oof, ah, let me relax here. No, it's time for us to move uh, in the classroom, to go around to each pair or to each group or to each student if it's an individual uh, activity so we can check if they know what to do. Some students, they are too shy to raise their hands and admit in front of everybody that they can't do the activity. So it's important that we go around and to take a look and um, make them feel comfortable with what they are doing there, right? And then now, yes, we have our patterns of um, interaction, right? So when we talk about patterns of interaction, we are talking about different possibilities in which students can interact with each other and with the teacher in the classroom. And um, the, the success of the teaching process, the learning process is very influenced by patterns of interaction that we can use in classroom activity. Um, we use them also to achieve desired learning outcomes. Um, we, when we choose patterns of interaction, it's important to um, think about if they are appropriate for each activity. What do I mean? We are going to, to talk a little bit more about that. But most of us um, try to make our lessons as communicative as possible. I try to. Uh, and when we do that, we have a lot of group work, we have a lot of pair work, and sometimes we have nothing of individual work. We have nothing of some time alone with our thoughts to try to understand, to read. So we have some time to un really understand um, the topic or the activity. So not every activity is designed to be a group activity, is designed to be a pair work. So we should think about the activities and then think about how uh, adequate, how appropriate they are uh, for the how, how the patterns of what which pattern of interaction is appropriate uh, for that, right? Uh, yes, it's um, um, the session will be on the YouTube for this out, right? It's going, it's being recorded, so it's going to be available uh, for everybody later. Also, the variety. If we only have pair work, it gets boring. If we only have group work, how about students who are more um, in, introspective, right? Uh, will they feel comfortable if they have to work in groups all the time? So we should vary patterns of interaction. Um, we should use different patterns of interaction to make our lessons more dynamic, to have a faster pace or a slower pace, it will depend, right? Um, to optimize interaction, to optimize communication, we should think about the patterns of interaction in terms of group cohesiveness, uh, the sense of belonging. I want our students to um, feel part of a group, right? To foster collaboration, to foster students' responsibility for their own learning, right? And what kind of patterns of interaction do we have? First, first of all, we have um, 
teacher and the whole group, right? So in this pattern of interaction, what happens here? The teacher interacts with all students at the same time. And we can do that to collect feedback from activities, for example, to elicit information from students from the whole group, to give instructions, because then I'm, I'm talking to everybody at the same time, um, among other things. I know that it is often said that when we have the teacher speaking to the whole group, I know that a lot of people say that it should be avoided because it raises um, teaching the, the teacher talking time. But we also can think about how good a way it is of providing students with quality input. We are models of the language to our students. So rather than just avoiding teacher and whole group moments, the problem is not using them. The problem is using this pattern of interaction all the time. So what can we do? We can use it when we think it's going to save us time, for example, to give instructions. Also, as an opportunity to expose our students to language and to draw their attention to useful language items. This is something that I think it's important that we always remember. We are language models to our students. So we don't want to speak the whole lesson. We want our students to communicate as well. But when we speak, we also provide students with input, right? Of the, the language. We have individual work. I'm sorry, we have individual work. And this is something that um, as an introvert, uh, I can truly relate to some students and students in general, they need time also to work on their own. Some alone time gives our students the chance to think, to assess how much they are learning, um, to reflect on the process that is taking place. When we think about um, communic the communicative approach and communicative approaches in general, which are, I'm not criticizing it, I think it's great, but usually they tend to make us always spare students, always group students, and always require uh, students to be speaking and communicating all the time. But we don't do that in real life also, right? In real life, we have some time to just think about it, just read, just reflect, just have some alone time to uh, think about what I have just learned, right? So too many communicative uh, activities, one after the other, might overload our students and might actually prevent them from some very beneficial time working on their own, right? Um, pair work and group work also, these, these are probably uh, the most common uh, interaction pattern used by teachers when we want to adopt communicative approaches to teaching. And of course, there are a lot of advantages to pair work and group work. Uh, and some advantages are enabling uh, students to help and learn from each other, right? So peer support, to let them work collaboratively, uh, to make them feel more confident when contributing uh, to the whole group. Uh, we when we have to we, when we want students to check answers for example we can have them do it uh in pairs right uh so they can um see how they can contribute to each other um when we pair our students 
up, it's always important that we consider the aim of the activity. So we can decide if it's more profitable uh, to have learners with similar or different levels of ability working together. We don't need to follow the same structure all the time. Sometimes we want students with different levels to work together. Sometimes we, we want students with the same levels of ability to work together. Um, and in some cases, of course, it might be very it might be a good idea to allow learners to decide who they'd like to work with, because this can foster their confidence and maximize the feeling of being safe in an environment. We always like when we have choice, right? When we are giving choice. Um, so depending on the aim of the activity, using different patterns of interaction can help us give uh, learners different roles in the classroom. For example, when we have a speaking activity, if my students are working in trios, in groups of three, one member of the group can be responsible for collecting samples of language and giving feedback when the activity is over. We were talking about uh, teenagers at the beginning. This is a great activity for teenagers because they, they can write, they can take notes, and they can um, vary this role in the group also. When we give learners roles, we add variety to our lessons. We contribute, it, it contributes to a more active participation in uh, in tasks also, and we also have, yes, mingling, right? We can have mingling activities. And when students mingle, we allow them to speak to as many partners as they can. And then I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, oh, mingling can be very noisy. Mingling can be very disorganized. Yes, but it is also very engaging. It is fun. It allows the, stu the students who do not feel very confident in whole group or pair work uh, to feel more relaxed, to loosen up and interact with others. And then we can mingle in different ways. For example, we can mingle using stations, right? Uh, yes, they love stations, right? It's mingling, but in a more organized way. Uh, and this is good for students, but it's also great for us because it helps us feel more confident and more secure in mingling activities. So with the stations we have here, uh, we have different stations, right? So we put uh, students into different groups and then we group students and we get some students to move to different groups while others stay at the station. This way, we can have students interacting with more partners than that group. We have the choo-choo train, which is also known as train station. And this type of mingling enables students, enables the students to work in pairs, but with different uh, partners and at a pace set by the teacher. As we can see in the image here, I'm sorry, guys, I have a kind of a cold. So as we can see here in the image, uh, we have two lines uh, and one of the lines stands still while the other moves. And then this way they can talk to different partners. We can also have inner inner and outer circles, right? Um, like onion rings. And then we can have, we can allow also uh, students to move, right? The inside circle or the outside circle moves when we say they should move. 
and then they can talk to different partners. Um, when we do these activities, students can be standing, but students can also be sitting. It's okay if they are sitting and they just stand to move to another uh, desk or another chair, right? If we are teaching students with mobility difficulties or any disabilities, it's a good idea to have all learners sitting rather than standing, right? Um, and also, always a good idea to anticipate problems. Um, so we need to remember to think about how long it may take our learners to organize desks and chairs, or if it is too long, uh, it's worth thinking about a different and more effective pattern of interaction for them, right? So always take our your students into consideration. We are coming uh, to the end of our session today, and there is also something that um, I think when we talk, especially with children, with teenagers, um, I, I think it's it, it can be easier to deal with that, but with uh, children, which is the use of L1, the use of their mother tongue. Should we let our students use their mother tongue? Should we speak to them into their mother tongue? Um, so, um, oh, <laughs> nice. I know, yes, already we are coming to the end of our session. So um, with when we have very young learners, somebody mentioned toddlers, sometimes their mother tongue, sometimes, no, a lot of times, their mother tongue makes them more comfortable at the beginning of the term. So for me, compassion is... Um, a good reason to use children's mother tongue and to let them use their mother tongue. These children, they need to know if the, when the teacher understands them and can interact with them in their own language. It makes them feel secure and helps to lower um, the affective filter, right? So uh, children don't get so anxious. Um, I never like when I have, for example, a child who is nervous for some reason or who is crying and uh, we have a teacher who speaks uh, the child's mother tongue but insists on speaking to the child in this situation in English. This will only make the child more anxious, right? It will only make the child uh, more nervous. So for compassion, sometimes it's important to um, forget a little bit about English and think about the child. Another thing um, is that children and teenagers too, they know when they speak their mother tongue. So when we say, what did you say? I don't understand. They know that you understood what they said. Um, so let's try to make it one of the rules in, in the classroom is to speak as much English as we can, right? So it's part of the rule. We can remind them of the rules that we created together at the beginning of our term. Um, but I know that finding the right amount of L1 in the classroom can be tricky, it's going to be, for with some groups, a situation of trial and error until we find the right amount. Um, sometimes the, the L1 is very uh, useful in the classroom, but as teachers, we also need to be careful not to rely on it too heavily. Um, if we always use... L1 to back up our explanations in English, students will inevitably just tune out um, the version in L2 and will only pay attention to L1. Uh, so we need to be aware of how much L1 is necessary 
uh, so we attempt to, to limit its use to the minimum. To finish, I would like us to finish with something that has to do with what I, I said here in the in the uh, when we're, I was talking about L1. It is a quote by Carol Reed. We started with Carol Reed and we finished with her as well. And it's the same article. This article is available on her website. There are very good articles that she wrote available that they are for free. So we can download them. And she says that, however large the class, it is vital that children feel you know and care about them as individuals rather than as a group to be controlled. Um, and I know, especially when we are at the beginning of our career, we might feel that we need to control children, uh, but it's not about control. It's about working together. It's about using strategies so students feel nervous. Uh, nervous? No. They feel comfortable, they feel confident, and they feel safe in the environment. Uh, as uh, young learners teachers, we are teachers and we are carers. We are caring for them. Um, so it's not about control. We are they are developing, they are learning a language as they develop at the same time. So it's a lot for them. So always first to um, have in mind that we should see them. Uh, individual characteristics, um, individual needs, and take them into consideration, right? Um, I think that's it. I want to... Uh, to invite you, we have a 10% discount on any course at Troika. Um, if you are interested, we have many interesting courses uh, coming up. There's a button here you can click to just go to the to the to get a, the discount. Thank you so much for being here. Find here. I appreciate your presence today. I hope you you enjoyed it. I don't know if you have any comments or if you have any other questions, feel free. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Right, it's going to be available also. Yes, the video is going to be available on uh, Desal's YouTube channel, right? So feel free to watch it later and take notes or anything, right? Thank you.